Well, we made it. <laughs> Unless Jesus comes back in the next 30 minutes, we've made it. It's a possibility. 20 months in the making, and it's been so much fun to walk through and to look at a, a presentation inspired by God so we hold the scriptures in such a way that these men were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the way Peter explains it. Nobody came up with this kind of stuff on their own, but they were moved along as they were filled with God and spoke. The reason I went here 20 months ago, sorry about that, is because I wanted you to see Jesus. I felt that intensely as to where we were in a moment in the church, in a moment with what's happening in our culture. I wanted you to see Jesus. Matthew's word, behold, see, look, how many times he uses it. He closes this book with Jesus saying that word again. Behold, look, see. I wanted you to see him from Matthew's eyes. Matthew, the despised, rejected tax collector, the Jewish tax collector, the traitor, as he was viewed by the religious of his day. Because it's Matthew who proclaims so clearly we see this when, when he's called in the book, Matthew chapter 9, and when Jesus is at his house and he's meeting with the, the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the, you know. And he says, I came for the sick, not for, the, not for those who think they're all healthy. And then Matthew shows Jesus saying this twice in this book. You had better learn what it means that I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Go and learn what that means. So I wanted you to see Jesus. I wanted you to see him, see him well. Look again and make sure that if you're a Christian, Christ, Messiah, if you're a messiah in if you're one who follows the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that you, you're like him. You're being transformed into his likeness by the renewing of your mind. He's changing you into him. And so that was good. And we end today with a, a famous passage in so many ways. The church calls this the Great Commission. This may well be one of the most famous verses in the entire book, the closing words of Matthew. Especially for a church like ours, we, we are not a denomination. I don't really, honestly, I don't feel that or see it in Scripture, and I'm not, I'm not saying such is terrible. I'm just saying you won't see that in Scripture. But we would call ourselves good newsers. That's the word evangelical. Evangelize the good, the good news. That's the Greek word. Evangelical is simply someone who is passionate about presenting the good news. You're, you're a good newser. That's what we like to call ourselves. Evangelical. If you're a church made out of that kind of cloth, that kind of fiber, I guarantee you've heard this verse before. This is the great commission of Jesus Christ and to, with, through his followers. The mission of God on earth in this age. That's how he closes it. And I would encourage you as I have all the way through this study that you might look at this verse a little different today and not just see it as a standalone passage. It's a great standalone passage. Most people can quote this, at least 19 and 20, and miss everything around it at times. But I would encourage you that you would see it now differently having just walked through Matthew. Yes, it's been a long walk. <laughs> 
but if you see it as the climax of the presentation of the good news of Jesus Christ, the King and his kingdom, you might see it just a little, a little differently today. How he's showing a fulfillment of where he started. This is Jesus the Christ, son of David. That's where this book begins. He's the king, and there's a statement in here that's so kingly, so high, it seems unparalleled, or I really can't say much anything greater in terms of rule. That's what a king does. A king rules over a kingdom, and in the kingdom are citizens of the king. So if you're a Christian, pay attention, because I would tell you again, as I have already many times, do you make sure you see him? Do you see him? And then in the midst of, of if you see him, do you see yourself as one who is in him, who does his bidding, his will, because he has given you life? I mean, if he wanted to, he could have saved you, rescued you, called you into his kingdom. You're now a child of God, born again, and then he would just have taken you home. Whip, gone. But that's not how he does it, is it? And if you've yet to see him, right, I mean, there's only and always two people in this room, those who know him, and believe in him, and those who are still, I hope and pray, evaluating, then I would call you to take a good look. See him even as he finishes out his last words, because he's still, the offer to see him still stands and belief. I mean, the resurrection speaks so strong to that. There's nothing like it. I said this last week, there's only one empty tomb. There's only one empty tomb. There's only one cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? And then there's only one empty tomb. So join me in Matthew chapter 28. We'll finish this out. I want to say something, though, about faith. In the, in the light of the resurrection, before we dig into just the last handful of verses here, just the last five verses of the book. The resurrection is so compelling, so motivating, so convicting and convincing that it, it, when I say it changes everything, I want you to look very carefully if you've yet to say, yeah, I'm convinced, I believe. Pay close attention to who believes. There are a handful of men that I would put in front of you historically that you have no explanation for outside of the resurrection. Consider them, I, I would pull three because we have the skeptic, the rejecter, and the antagonist in these three. And that just kind of meets everybody, I guess. We talked about Thomas. <coughs> Excuse me. Don't, don't forget Thomas. Thomas. Thomas, remember Thomas says, I will not believe unless I put my finger in the marks where the nails were and I put my hand in his side. We looked at that on Easter Sunday if you were here with us. John records him. To say he was a skeptic is, he's at least an agnostic. That's a term that means I don't have enough information. A knowledge, agnosticism, no knowledge. I need more before I can believe. What is it that would compel Thomas to become a man of faith? The resurrection. He said it with his own mouth, I will not unless, and he becomes an eyewitness. To this day, he's one of the most firmly attested to historical figures in terms of the apostles. You can go to India today in Chennai and see where he, where he was. They still have Thomas Christians 2,000 years later. And Chennai is where his gravesite is. It's compelling. The other man I would have you consider as the second one is his brother, 
half-brother, brother through Mary, James. You read the book of Acts and you will not miss James. James was an absolute rejecter. Jesus' brothers did not believe in him. That is recorded in multiple Gospels. Mark and then John, at one moment in, in Capernaum, he went home. In this text, Mark 30, or Mark chapter 3, verse 20, referring to his probably Peter's home, his home base was Capernaum. And the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. He had massive following. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, take control of him. For they were saying, he's out of his mind. <laughs> this is a brother's. One would presume not to impose this upon Mary, but the brothers for sure. John records this, chapter 7 and verse 3. So his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples, your disciples, also may see the works that you're doing. No one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Then John writes, for not even his brothers believed in him. James is the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He is recorded historically by several authors, including Josephus, who records his martyrdom. I think it was 62 A.D. What compels James to become a believer? There's no rational explanation for James, no reasonable explanation short of the resurrection. Listen to Paul as he writes of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered to you, this is a creed of the early church. They, would, they had memorized this. They didn't have a Bible. This was a creed. It's creedal the way it reads in the rhythm. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according with, in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James. <laughs> what in the world could compel James to be a believer in Jesus Christ? Only that. There's no explanation for James any other way. And he is the leader of the church in Jerusalem. The last one I would tell you if you yet to believe the eyewitness which you have in front of you is Paul. I mean, what in the world would convince Paul? We would call Paul a, a modern-day terrorist, an ancient. He went around persecuting those who did not believe in Judaism as he did, in particular the Christians, because he believed them to be perverting Judaism. And so he raged against them. Acts chapter 9, but Saul still breathing, listen to Dr. Luke, Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. As he approached Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, that's his Hebrew name. Paul is his Roman name. Why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Ooh. What is going to change Paul? Nothing short of the resurrection. And his death is well attested to historically. He died under Nero's reign after the great fire of Rome, the historians say that Nero himself started, 64 AD. That both Paul and Peter, at some point shortly thereafter, were executed. Peter crucified because he's a Jew. Paul, he had the gracious offering of being beheaded because he was a Roman citizen. There you go. See, there are benefits.
Listen to Paul. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. I I submit that to you. It was compelling to me when I became a, a believer many years ago now. You have to deal with these characters historically. You've got not just Jesus. You have to deal with him historically too. But you need to deal with the other characters that are documented in history, like Paul, the apostle. Jesus appears, chapter 28, in Jerusalem to the women only that Matthew records. He doesn't give us any other appearance in Jerusalem. We know he appears to the 11. We know there are other appearances. Matthew doesn't speak of those. He doesn't show you with the 11 until Galilee. There's significance in that as the capstone to Matthew's presentation of Jesus the Christ. So there we go. The resurrection is affirmed. There was a lie told that Matthew says is still spread among the Jews to this day. This story has been spread among the Jews to this day that somehow his body was stolen. But that's the problem with all these appearances and changes in the way people responded. Verse 16, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee When Jesus appeared to the women, even the angel, when he spoke to the women, he told them, tell the disciples, go to Galilee, go to Galilee, go to Galilee. He didn't say, stay here, and then I'll, he said, tell them to go to Galilee. There's beauty and significance there as they move, and then they go up on the mountain. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Now, it's funny, there's no sense and no words with regard to where that mountain, what what mountain were they on around the Sea of Galilee or the area of Galilee? But if you're paying attention in Matthew, you could take a good guess. When Matthew begins the ministry of Jesus Christ and unfolds how the gospel began to be preached, it's in Galilee. He's tempted by the devil in chapter 4. Chapter 4 then moves to this. John the Baptist is arrested. Jesus withdraws to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, where he grew up, he went and he lived in Capernaum on the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach. Here are his first public words. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew tells us that he goes to the region of Galilee. Look at the name that's recorded in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Galilee of the Goim. In, in Greek, it's, it's the ethnos, the Gentiles. Galilee of the Gentiles. He's now about to tell them about the Gentiles. When chapter 4 ends... Jesus goes up on a mountain in Galilee, and we now call that the Sermon on the Mountain. Of course, we like to call it the Sermon on the Mount, but the word used is mountain there. The Sermon on the Mount is where God speaks from the mountain. Out of Egypt, chapter 2, worshipped by the Gentiles, out of Egypt, through the water, chapter 3, the baptism. Chapter 4, into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Chapter 5, up the mountain to give the law. He's teaching and preaching to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. I would say, I would bet 
50 cents. <laughs> but this mount is the mount of the Sermon on the Mount. I think that's where he's at. Some people say that what you're about to hear is the time when he appeared to the 500 all at one time. The 11 are there for sure, but almost certainly there's others. We would pick that up, I think, from the, from the, the, the midst of this. Remember in Matthew that it's so clear, Matthew makes this clearer than any other writers, that the kingdom will be taken away from Israel and given to another. Again, this is firm in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42 and 43, 43 being exclusive to Matthew. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? He's speaking to the religious leaders, the Jews at this point that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? Psalm 118. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. Here we go. This is it. This is the new people. Who is this people? Well, you're going to find out it's you if you're in Christ. Yours is the kingdom to move forward. Yours is the kingdom to produce its fruit until the end. So now he's, the scene is set. They were on the mountain that Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Now, I don't know, you know, a little bit of ink has been spilled over who the some are. I would presume it's not one of the 11. There would probably have been others there on the mountain with them. The word doubted is not a common word for doubt. We would probably translate it. They wavered. They were, they hesitated. You see the word too at the beginning of the Greek word. They're, they were mixed about their movement. But, you, but I don't, can't imagine the 11 at this point. And the 11, they worshiped him because he's God. A Jew never worshiped anyone that wasn't God. They worshiped him. But some, they wavered. There was doubt. Now, his kingship. And Jesus came and he said to them on the mountain, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. If that's not the most comprehensive statement of kingship that there is in Scripture, think it through again. All authority in heaven where God dwells and the angelic beings dwell and on earth where we are has been given to me. That's a king statement. There's an aspect of that that was his authority by identity. He is son of God. He is Messiah Son of the living God. All authority in heaven is His. He is the Son, the second person of the Trinity. But there's a sense in the way He says it here, it has been given to me, that there's a, a completion now. He is the ruling Son of Man at this point. He died, He was buried, and He now lives again. There's nothing that isn't under his authority in the midst of all this. This was his last push on the Jewish leaders. He asked them, what do you make of David's statement in Psalm 110? Who's the Christ come from? And they said, David. Then how is it that David says this, Psalm 110.1, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. That's a king position until I make your enemies your footstool. How is it that God, the I am, says to my Adonai this? Who is David talking to? Who's he referring to that he's calling his Adonai? The Christ, God. And they couldn't answer him. He is in a position of authority. The writer of Hebrews, New Testament, but a beautiful interpretation of the old. Now, the point is, what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, Jesus, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Remember how your Bible starts? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is all his reign now. That's a comprehensive statement. Now, I want you to jump to the very end before we do the middle. The middle is like a hamburger and these two buns surround it. Sorry, I'm Italian. Everything's got a food analogy with it. If the top of this bun is, I am in charge of everything. Look at the bottom. The very last thing he says, right? And behold, look, see, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's not futuristic. It's not, it's not saying, I will be with you. It, he's saying it is a present, active presence. It's permanent. I am with you always to the end of the age. Now he's speaking as a king to those who through him are in him, his citizens. You must weigh this very heavily. If all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him, and he is with you, I am with you to the end of the age, which is the second coming. Then if you're doing what he's about to ready to put in the middle, it will happen. Guaranteed. There is no stopping what we call the great commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and look, see, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Do this. It is a guarantee of moving the kingdom forward, which they would be commissioned to do, would happen. There is nothing that will stop the church. The church will bleed and die regularly, but nothing will stop her. That's a guarantee. In fact, she tends to move much more effectively in the midst of bleeding and dying. When she gets comfortable, she tends to miss what she's supposed to be doing. Now, look what he tells them to do. Now, we, we, we know this in the midst of this. Now, verse 19, this is where we typically start, right? I, 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 this is the part start of the commission, the great commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. He's at Galilee of the Gohim, of the, of, of the, of the ethnics. Now he's speaking to them about reaching the world. He's talking to a group of Jewish men. The statement that he's making here is it's not just for Israel. It's not just reach the world with this. Reach the nations. He's speaking to men who were Jews. He's the Messiah, Son of God, Son of Man. Reach the the world, the ethnics, that's ethnos in the Greek, reach the nations. Now the key with this passage is because we tend to put too much emphasis on the go. The go is passive. It's in the passive voice, which means it isn't the imperative here. It's not the command. It's as you go. As you, in fact, it's aorist, meaning tense isn't the issue either. Not past, not present, not future. That's not the issue. So it's like this, as you're going, as you're going, as you went, as you go, as you will go. As you're going. Therefore, relating back to the fact that everything has been put under his authority, reach the nations, make disciples. That's a verb, by the way. It's not a noun. Make disciples, not, not make people. The ver it's like this. Be discipling. As you go, as you are going, be discipling. Be discipling. There's the imperative. That's what he calls them. He calls us. He commands us to do to the nations as you go. I, I love to think of this, that he's saying, as you live, live for God. Reach all peoples as you're living for God. It doesn't mean you've got to go here or go there. God may look at you or call you and say, go here, go there. He moved me. 
He may tell you to move. He may tell you to move to another country. That may well be the case. This verse is bigger, thicker, fatter than that. This is a command on your life to live for God in the going of your life. On this same mountain, I think, here comes the, from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, after the Beatitudes. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. People do not light a lamp and then put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house in the same way that your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Your light is your identity as a believer. You're a live tree. They will see your fruit. They will see your works. If you're alive, you'll, they'll see fruit. You should be puzzled if someone claims to be a Christian and there's no fruit. They should see fruit. That's not the light. Your light is your identity. God lights the light. God lights the lamp. Shine. When you shine, you'll show them with the Holy Spirit who he, what he looks like. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. They'll see it. If you shine, they'll see it. They'll stick out in a weird world like we live in. They will stick out. We mean self-control. What does that mean? Quit obeying those dumb rules. Uh, this is God in me, living. Living for God. That's the first movement that God calls you in the midst of giving your life not to change your Sunday habits. He wants to change your habits through the course of the week. He wants, he wants you all week long, not just today. In fact, I'm going to get real bold here. He wants your whole month. I'm really going out on a limb. He wants this year of you because he gave you life. He bought you. He wants your life. As you go, you live for God. You are discipling by shining with your pattern of behavior, your deeds, and with your mouth to the nations. Reach. Well, that's the next emphasis, right? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all ethnos, the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Here the triune God is explicitly called out by Jesus. Remember when Jesus was baptized? You had this exact scene of the triune God. The Father speaks from heaven. This is my Son with Him, my beloved, with whom I'm well pleased. You have the Son being symbolically baptized, though there was no removal of sin needed as if it needed to be symbolized, but he would represent mankind, son of man, and the spirit descending like a dove. And now he says baptize. Baptism is the symbolism of faith in Christ. And this, listen, this must be personal as you engage. Don't think, yeah, I know those guys at church, they, they do that stuff. You reach people baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, meaning bring them life, reach them. I stand here today because a man in the marketplace did that, befriended me, got close to me, talked with me, just invited me to read the Bible, and I'm thinking, ah, okay, fine, fine. And then God did his good work. <laughs> Reach people with your life. After I came to know Christ, you want to know what happened with this? I started a Bible study in my own family. I didn't know what I was doing. And we were reading through the Gospel of John because it was the easiest. It is the easiest to read through. 
And before we got done, and I know you're thinking, well, knowing you, that was what, four years, five years? <laughs> My mother accepted Christ. And the seeds were planted that eventually my father accepted Christ. As you go, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You represent Christ. You reach people that way. I mean, every now and then you'll get so sick and disgusted, you'll, you might look up to the heavens and say, God, what are you doing? Why are you waiting? Why not? Why aren't you returning? Well, that question got answered a long time ago. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Don't forget this one thing, dear friends. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise of returning. That's the immediate context. As some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God, why are you taking so long? And he might shout back, get at it. I get asked that regularly. You think Jesus is coming back in our lifetimes? And I, I want to say, if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, maybe. Yeah, well. And then you have a friend maybe that doesn't know Christ, and then, okay. Well, hang on, Jesus. Give me another week or two or ten with a soul so I can watch you do your thing because he does his thing. Amen. Right, so that's the movement through this and the capstone, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. That is the capstone here. Disciple, be discipling. It's a noun. Past tense, present tense, future tense. It's aorist in the Greek. It means just be doing it. Be discipling. Per imperative. How? Reach. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. My goodness, that's when the church has lost her mission. When we no longer teach the words of Jesus Christ. And it's easy to do because the pressure from the culture is so hard at times. Oh, I'm just going to follow my gut on this one. Ooh, not a good thing, because your gut might be rotten. I, I, I pass a, another church periodically. They had to change their name because their denomination decided they weren't going to follow the teachings of Jesus anymore. So they changed their name to be a, a different part of the denomination. <laughs> a special part of the special part of the church. <laughs> Denominations. Hold to the words of Jesus and do it with humility as best you can. Teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. By what? By, do, by living. By living with them and and uh, open your life up that way by your mouth. Don't wait forever before you say something about, well, what do you think happens when you die? I mean, what does happen? I mean, there's not a soul that attends a funeral that that hasn't hit them. Look at Jesus' comment about obedience. This is a fact, not a command. If you love me, the fact of the matter is, you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. And he to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. There's, there's the end of the passage. And, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age, which is the second coming of the Son, the King. And at that point, he's wearing a different crown here on this earth. It's called a diadem. It's a kingly crown, not a crown of thorns. But the first crown needed to happen 
for this king so that the second crown could show the achievement all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. As you go, be discipling. Give them your life. Reach people. Baptism is the sign of the faith in Jesus Christ. Born. Dead. Alive. Teach them about what I've commanded you. And I'm with you. And that's good. And listen, this was so much a gospel to the Jews. I would say this very carefully and very emphatically. God's not done with Israel yet. He is not done with her. I mean, there's movement now that's wow. Paul, a Jew of Jews, as he calls himself, a Pharisee. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the grand rabbis, who was the grandson of Hillel, one of the most famous rabbis of Jesus' time. Paul was under this teaching, and he says, I would, I would be cursed just to have my brethren come to know Jesus. That's how chapter 9 starts. In Romans chapter 11, he makes this comment to the church. Lest you be wise in your own sight, church. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers and sisters, brethren. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. <laughs> you should picture in your mind a counter. Click, 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 click. We always want to look at a watch. It's actually a soul counter. Did you ever see like the national debt? That's what I picture here. But it's counting souls of the Gentiles. It's counting souls in the church because you're no longer a Jew nor a Gentile once you become a citizen of the kingdom. And when that number hits, you want me to tell you how big it is? Um, I know, but I'm not going to tell you. When that number hits, the deliverer will come. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, Isaiah 59, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Whew. That is the end of the age. And the next one, Ooh, it'll be good. Church, you see him? You see you? You see this great co-mission? It's ours to move the kingdom forward in the hearts of mankind until that number hits, whatever it is. And I don't know when, but if you get busy, we could get it here. That's where Peter says, speed it up, man. Speed it up. Live like you're supposed to live. Speed, it's coming. And that's a beautiful thing. Amen? Amen.